Welcome to Vision, bienvenidos a Visión, la sección de Lima de la Liga Mundial de Abogados Ambientalistas que tenemos todos los últimos sábados y los sábados de cada mes en esta Lima Mundial que hemos obtenido a través de todas estas redes sociales. Gracias por compartir con nosotros el día de hoy. Hoy tenemos un programa en inglés. ¿Se acuerdan que la vez pasada dijimos que teníamos a la doctora Janet Lewis para hablar de la salud mental, no solamente con el medio el medio ambiente en general, sino cambio climático, todo lo que es el global warming, todo lo que es el calentamiento global, sino que todo lo que está pasando actualmente en el planeta Tierra. Hoy quisiéramos decirle que tienen subtítulos en el YouTube, tienen subtítulos en Facebook, pueden activarlos por favor para saber qué estamos hablando, ya que el Dr. Janet Lewis eh, habla solamente inglés y vamos a aprovechar cada, cada frase, cada palabra que nos diga para poder coordinar y recoordinar y reorganizar nuestra mente con todo lo que está sucediendo en el planeta, no solamente en el medio ambiente, sino en nuestro medio social. Y con todo lo que está pasando en Asia, que afecta a cada país y cada uno de nosotros en el mundo. Así que muchas gracias por estar hoy en Visión una vez más en este sábado del mes de febrero 19, que hoy estamos junto a Dr. Janet Lewis. Welcome to Vision, the section of Lima. Lima the Boloba Environmental Lawyers League that we are having every Saturday last of the month each year. Thank you for being here with us. Remember that we were having a special guest speaker the other time that I was like, okay, don't get out from there because like Saturday 12, I think, or remember, yes, um, we're having the same guest speaker, special, talented. I am so honored to have her. Dr. Jana Lewis with, you, with us. Okay, she's here right now. Yes, so we are going to talk to her. She's going to literally um, educate us in everything she knows. She's really talented. Dr. Jana Lewis is with us here just to talk about mental health, not only about climate change, um, the atmosphere, like global warming, not only about that, but about mental health, human beings, like in every single area, aspect, and especially right now with everything that is happening around the world, like the war in Asia, Um, does this affect us like in every single country, in every single human being or not? Like it's so far away in Russia, we don't even speak Russian, so why do we have to be concerned or what? Or we just have to be like literally, okay, you know what, I'm gonna go to a supermarket and just like buy a lot of things just in case we have a war here like in the other continent. Um, we're gonna speak about everything and of course about children. If you are literally a human being that knows that youth generations will literally lead the world because we are old, yes, just get it, we are old, you will understand that children are the most valuable today because they are the ones that will lead literally the planet when we are not here anymore. So I love to educate me first in the least and everybody about how can we make the youth generations children teens, teenagers, like middle school, high schools, even younger, like one, two, three years old, because they're so smart right now, being literally aware of everything that we didn't have, everything of sustainable health, sustainable heart, sustainable, sustainability, sustainability, vision is that, a sustainable perspective versus the real or cruel reality that we have and every single customs that we are having like sharing and burden in ourselves since millions of years and generations. So for that we have an expert. I mean, she's beautiful, she's lovely, she's so kind, she's she's amazing. And she's Dr. Janet Lewis. Hi Dr. Janet, how are you? Hello, hello. I am so honored, I mean we are so honored to have you here, like the president of Lima Um, Mr. Aquilino Gonzalez, Dr. Aquilino Gonzalez says thank you for being here. He gives you wow. a big hug and it's an honor just to be literally here watching you and just learning from you. So thank you so much for being here with us. Oh, well, thank you. It's very heartening to be here. As you know, I'm a psychiatrist uh, in um, private practice in central New York state. And I have an appointment at the University of Rochester, but more importantly here, I'm uh, on the climate committee of the group for the advancement of psychiatry, which is a think tank within psychiatry. And I'm also a founding member of the Climate Psychiatry Alliance. Um, so we've been focused on 
on this. Wow. So if there's anybody in the world that can say like, is she authorized to talk about this? Oh yeah, she is. <laughs> yes, she is. So, um, well, I will thank God for your life. Thank you, God, for Dr. Donald Lewis life because you're going to bless us today with everything that you're going to share. So please, I don't want to waste any more time of my mouth and my speak. We want to hear you. You're the star here. So just please, Dr. Donald Lewis, just share your screen. And of course, that um, our first question for this is like, what has climate change to do with like mental health? Okay, that's what I'll be talking about. So I can okay. share the screen here. Please. Um, and uh, get to the presentation. Um, uh, it is really uh, heartening to be here. Um, I uh, let's see, I'm trying to get to the proper proper view of this for myself. Here we go. Um, it's so good to know that there are people around the world who are uh, caring about climate change and engaged and that we're all in this together. Uh, Carrie Gard invited me here today after she came across a children's book called Coco's Fire. And she told me it was what we really need uh, right now. It's a good book for children but the parents reading it are also finding it therapeutic. We've definitely been getting that feedback. Uh, I don't make any money from this book. Most of the money, most of the proceeds go to funding um, climate mental health research. Um, so I'll be talking about mental health and climate change and the things we all need psychologically in dealing with climate change and the things that children in particular need. Um, many of us uh, are also thinking about what's going on in Eastern Europe and in other places in the world. And many of the psychological skills applicable to climate change are also applicable to our other crises. Um, to write the children's book, Coco's Fire, the think tank of psychiatrists I mentioned uh, worked with environmental scientists. The book was workshopped with children and parents and school teachers and child psychologists. It's based upon the results of a literature review of how best to speak with children about climate change. It's aimed for children ages six to nine um, and is for parents and teachers to be able to read with children. Coco's a little squirrel who hears about climate change and she's anxious about it. And the story is how her father squirrel helps her and Coco's then able to connect with the thriving community of scientists and activists working on the problem. And she also uh, finds out how to work locally herself. And in the course of the story, a scary fire in her belly turns into an inspiring cooler blue looking fire friend. And uh, for those who can see the slides here, um, Coco is holding hands with her fire friend while looking at a big friendly earth. I trust all those who are listeners of this show know what climate change is. As you know, that climate change uh, means our climate has been destabilized largely from greenhouse gas emissions, from uh, human activities. The mental health effects of climate change are getting more widely appreciated now. There are both direct and indirect mental health effects of climate change. There are direct effects of our increasing frequency and intensity of disasters, storms, flooding from sea level rise, droughts, wildfires, heat waves. Um, and there, uh, this graphic uh, is from the Eco America report, uh, which does a, a good job detailing uh, mental health effects. Um, there, uh, we know disasters have these profound direct mental health effects. There's direct trauma, often the rates of PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, following disasters can be as high as 30%. And there are also higher rates of depression, anxiety, substance abuse, and domestic violence following disasters. There's damage to social or community infrastructure following disasters, such as food systems and medical services, 
and this causes additional stress. Evacuation from fires from disaster zones is known to reduce psychological risk, but still uh, there are high rates of acute stress in evacuees. And where we have trauma, um, we can also have what gets called the transgenerational transmission of trauma, where children are affected by their parents themselves having been traumatized, uh, even at times when parents are doing their best uh, to be available to the children. And another big concern is that uh, one's vulnerability to disaster and one's ability to cope with the disaster are affected by the extent of one's social and material resources. So this is a way that climate change gets called a threat multiplier. Those who are already disadvantaged can become further disadvantaged because of the uh, disasters caused by climate change. And then there's the whole host of ways climate change can cause distress more indirectly. Uh, just in thinking about our physical reality, there are threats to anything anyone might care about uh, beyond some ultimate spiritual uh, concerns. There is disorientation and grief over our changing world. Solastalgia, which is a kind of nostalgia you can have while still at home because the environment has changed and doesn't offer the same solace. There's a loss of previously imagined legacies. Um, when you think about it, uh, we tend to think that the world is going to go on beyond us, that the things we do will go on beyond us in a world that looks somewhat like this world. But now there's a great deal of uncertainty about what the world's uh, going to look like. There's empathy for current and future suffering of people and of other uh, species. Um, People and other species are suffering right now as a result of climate impacts, and that is uh, going to uh, continue probably to increase. Um, there's worries for children and grandchildren, including worries for potential children and grandchildren. Many people are now wrestling with whether they should have children out of concern uh, for what the world will be, that their children will have. Um, and for some people also out of concern for the carbon footprint uh, that another child will create. And in addition to the direct trauma caused by disasters, there can be demoralization from repeated disasters and from climate related displacements, forced migrations uh, because of climate effects. Those are all the stresses associated with our physical reality. Then there are also a lot of stresses associated with our social reality. Um, this also brings forms of distress. There's cognitive dissonance as we're all embedded in social and cultural systems that involve things we know to be destructive, like fossil fuel use and animal agriculture. Um, and cows put out methane both ends, so, so this is a real contribution to climate change. There's anime, uh, which is when our society does not reflect our values, and that can be distressing. There's a lack of words and terms uh, for our current experience. Uh, this is improving, but there's still a lack of words and terms. There's a lack of appropriate discussion at every level about climate change. This is improving, but it's still inadequate. There's inadequate societal response to the emergency. This is also improving, but still inadequate. There's conflict and social discomfort in addressing climate change. In the United States, about seven to nine percent of the population are people who would be called climate dismissive, people who um, uh, very vocally oppose the scientific consensus. And so when you're talking with someone, you, you may not know whether or not they're dismissive of climate change. And, and this can be uncomfortable. It can also be uncomfortable because we know the subject can arouse anxiety. And so it can be uncomfortable to bring it up. There's also difficulty integrating climate change information itself. Uh, this has been demonstrated in, in, uh, in psychological research. People often tend to keep 
climate change sort of in one portion of their mind and it's not well integrated into the rest of their thinking. And this contributes to something called disavowal, which is a, a defense mechanism uh, that I will talk about a bit more later. And then another uh, source of stress is that there's uncertainty. Uh, there's uncertainty about what our social reality is going to look like, as well as uncertainty about what our physical reality is going to look like. And as we've been talking about, there's particular concern for the effects of climate change on young people. And this is for a few reasons. Young people are vulnerable developmentally. Uh, their minds and their brains are still developing. And so climate effects have particular effects upon them. Um, for example, it's known that if someone experiences a disaster before the age of five, they're more likely to have an anxiety disorder in adulthood. Uh, there are also existential concerns that children can have, and this has been documented in some studies uh, where children have existential concerns about their future. They can have pessimism about the future of the planet. And also because of the dependency of young people, they can have particular feelings of betrayal, uh, feeling betrayed by adults and by governments um, who have not yet adequately uh, arisen to the challenge of climate change. So in thinking about uh, the emotional responses that we have to climate change, there's a whole array of them. And the term climate anxiety or eco-anxiety can be considered a kind of umbrella term that encompasses this array of forms of distress um, caused by uh, climate change and by our environmental uh, degradation and by our inadequate coping reactions uh, to what's going on with the environment. Uh, this is a word cloud figure from a review article by Coffee et al. And it highlights the, the broad range uh, of vocabulary and phrases in the existing literature to illustrate these various concepts related to eco-anxiety. So there's anxiety, anger, grief, despair, paralysis, guilt, uh, what gets called pre-traumatic stress. You see there's dread, there's shame. Um, now, importantly, distress over our climate and environmental situation is not itself pathological. These are normal feelings. The existence of all these terms is important because having particular words for experience helps people to process experience and to think more clearly. It helps us to be able to find others uh, who are similarly uh, feeling in order to be able to have support and to work together. This topic of eco-anxiety or climate anxiety is important for those of us who are clinicians for a couple of reasons. We want to be able uh, to help with individual suffering, but also from a public health point of view, eco-anxiety is important because anxiety can interfere with effective psychological adaptation. And effective psychological adaptation to climate change is what is needed for us individually and collectively. Um, um, Dr. Janet, can I ask yeah, you something? Ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I saw like a lot of words, but like a lot of words, like one is like interrelated with the other one. And I saw one that says psychotheratic. What yeah. is that? Oh, okay. Yeah, psychotheratic um, means our uh, our emotional and psychological experience in relation to the natural world. Wow. It, it has to do with how we experience our relationship with the natural world. So, solastalgia that I mentioned is one psychotheratic. Uh, experience, an, an experience that has to do with our relationship with the natural world. Solastalgia, as I said, is when um, we have this sense of nostalgia while we're still at home because the natural world no longer offers the same solace. It, it has changed. Um, and, and we have the pangs 
uh, of that. So that's what psychotyratic means. It means our psychological uh, involvement in our relationship with the natural world. And does this like this uh, brings a pattern in a human being? I, I'm not quite sure what you're asking. Yeah, can this bring like literally from one word we're getting like a ladder of a lot of words, just getting to a, like a pathological therapy all the time? There are there are a lot of responses having to do with our relationship to the natural world. Right. Our relationship to the natural world is a real relationship. You know, it's a real relationship, like a relationship with a parent or a spouse or a child. It's a real relationship. And so um, there, there are feelings and experiences, responses that we have in our relationship with the natural world. And now that the natural world um uh is in many places degraded and threatened you know that that affects us right and i was thinking um like um like in caucus fire i love that book uh like in caucus fire um i was thinking like if how like if men and women being a couple right um they don't like they don't get along together well they don't have a good relationship with their kids um they are stressed because of work they are stressed because of financial situation or everything um are they gonna probably have like a good relationship with the environment or just understand something or they will like literally um treat everything uh, around them like they are that's a good question you know we we tend patterns in our relationships and we tend to generalize those patterns to other relationships so a good relationship with the natural world there's every reason to think that that can help us in having other kinds of good relationships and vice versa um but you're right when if we if we have patterns of relating that uh are more narcissistic that are more exploitative um uh, then that can play out in various spheres of our life also. Right, and affect the children that we are speaking um, right here, right? Like they, yes. because the children copies everything, like they're a child, like we were right. tired. We, we copy what we see in everywhere. And if we don't have mother or father presence there, we copy our neighbor. Like we have to copy somebody because we don't know. So we are there to just copy, you know, to, to just absorb like SpongeBob or so. Um, right. right right so parents so it's important for parents to model that right. it's that it's important for us to be caring in all of our relationships including our relationship with the natural world right amazing yes. thank you so much yeah yes um so so uh i'll go on here um many of you have probably seen this graph if you've taken an introduction to psychology course um it shows how there's an optimal level of arousal. There's an optimal level of stress. Um, we need some stress to be able to prompt us to do things. But if we have too much stress, it interferes with our performance. It interferes with our ability to do things. It interferes with our ability to think clearly. And because of all the forms of stress related to climate change that I talked about, climate change easily pushes us beyond that optimal spot and interferes with our ability to address climate change, with our ability to think clearly and, and be able to address it well. Um, and so here I want to mention, um, as Carrie talked about it at the very beginning of the hour here, what I think is sort of the elephant in the room, that we have multiple crises we're dealing with with and people will often say how can i focus on climate change when we're dealing with so many crises um there's not only uh the the environmental crisis there are also prior and ongoing exploitations and injustices like systemic racism there's attraction to authoritarian leadership that we're seeing in many places in the world there's the pandemic there are these issues in our in our public discourse where uh, some people are calling it a post-truth kind of world. Uh, there's social polarization. There, there are many crises, um, both in particular countries and, and in the entire world. Uh, this is getting called a meta crisis as our current ways of doing things are coming up against 
there are limitations um, as we're in a, a very big transition, I think. Um, but the principles of psychological adaptation also apply to this whole complex of crises we're dealing with in our time of enormous transition. And how we orient ourselves and our children to climate change is also applicable to how we can orient to this whole hot mess. Um, one thing that helps with the anxiety is having a clear idea of what we're aiming for. What is psychological adaptation to climate change? It doesn't just happen. We have to know what it is and we have to work for it. Psychological adaptation is turning towards climate change rather than away from it in a way that's engaged, in a way that allows for positive affect, positive feelings, and a sense of well being, um, and in a way that creates the mental space to think clearly about what to do, being able to assess and reassess our goals and the pathways to those goals. This is psychological adaptation, and this ability undergirds all other forms of adaptation to climate change. If we can't give this to ourselves and our children, then we won't be able to do all the other kinds of mitigation and adaptation activities that are necessary. So, so how do we do it? Um, there are many healthy ways that we're able to bear what can be difficult to bear. Psychologically, we call these forms of containment. Now, in order to access them, sometimes we, have, we first have to ground ourselves doing things that can help to lower our level of activation, like breathing exercises or walking outside or praying, other, other kinds of spiritual practices. Um, in the Coco's Fire book, the father squirrel leads Coco in a, in a breathing exercise when, when Coco's anxious. Um, but then there are a variety of means of containment for dealing with eco-anxiety. Containment, as I said, is all about how do we bear what's difficult to bear? And there are ways to do this that are adaptive, that are not the maladaptive solution of indefinitely not thinking about climate change. Um, every one of these means of containment in one way or another allows us to get to a bigger space to identify with something larger. So there's relational containment, which involves working within supportive relationships with other people. Uh, this is particularly important with climate change because the problems are collective and the solutions are largely collective. There's agentic containment, focusing on action, focusing on what we can do. Um, there's spiritual containment, leaning on our spiritual frameworks and practices. There's narrative containment, identifying with a story. And for climate change, this is usually a story that has to do with our being in a time of great transition. And one can also identify with a particular story of transition, like the Hebrews time in the desert. Um, and then there are means of cognitive containment. Our larger understandings and how we think about things can contain us. I'm going to go over a few examples of kinds of cognitive containment. These are foundations of what can help us in our psychological adaptation to climate change as well as to all the other complex crises of our times. Uh, there's um, Dr. Janet, yeah. uh, um, okay. before you, you, you continue just a second, I uh -huh. um, want to mention something that is, well, is li like literally very interesting. Um, the Hebrews in the desert, you know, um, I can not imagine how um, literally God it has so much patience, <laughs> like literally, you know, like they were literally in the desert without food, without anything, and they had to adapt for something that they never, never um, just figure out in their mind, you know. And um, I just figure out how God, and this is some, some interesting question that I want to ask you. Um, if we don't know that there's a creator in the world, right? If you don't, if we don't have that pattern of relationship or awareness that there's a God, a creator, name it 
as you want to name it, you know. Uh, but there's someone else that didn't have to be created. It's out existent, you know. It's like omnipotent. I did not create myself, you know. So um, this God for me is literally God. Um, if we don't have this relationship with the Creator, how we are going to understand what the Creator creates as nature? Um, how we are going to understand how we are if the Creator creates, literally, God creates us to be your image, I mean, His image, you know, um, for Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So, how we are going to know and to adapt to these um, psychology patterns that we literally cannot change if we do not even know that there's a creator in the world and it's not just some human being that just just created everything and that's not true so um how can we literally um adapt if we don't believe that there's a creator that there's a god well you know as as i was listing there with all these forms of containment it is important to have ways to 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 get to a larger space uh, in our thinking, to be able to identify with something larger. Um, and, and for many people, uh, it is helpful to have, to have spiritual beliefs and practices uh, to lean on. Um, other people are using relationships, are using identifying with other stories, are using focusing on their own action, as I said. Um, but you're right, spiritual beliefs uh, are really, really uh, helpful. Um, so here talking about cognitive forms of containment, there's something called positive reappraisals or, or reframing, um, which, uh, can be helpful. And this involves accepting reality, um, but also being able to kind of turn our thinking inside out in a way that can elicit positive feelings and a sense of well-being. Um, this can be as simple as reminding ourselves about all the other activists and scientists and others who are working hard on this. Um, in the Coco's Fire book, Coco is able to think about all the scientists and activists and others who uh, are working on, on climate change. Um, and based upon my own experience and that of colleagues, here I've written out some other useful positive reappraisals the people are able to get to. Now, Carrie, you were just talking about um, being able to think in terms of what's going on um, at the level of, of a creator. Um, and I, I don't wanna dismiss that, but I also don't want people to think about, well, if, if you don't have that, then you can't, then you can't um, work on other forms of psychological adaptation. So, um, so here are other useful positive reappraisals. The situation being so serious, also means what we do now is really important. Um, the situation being so complex also means that the butterfly effect is at play. Who knows what the impact of one's own actions might be? It may be huge. That no one person can figure things out means we're being thrown into ways of thinking and behaving that are actually more mature. We have to work with others to figure things out and create change. We have to accept uncertainty. Our being forced to grow up in this way is a positive thing. Um, so you can see all these ways of thinking are ways of kind of turning our thinking inside out that allow us to generate positive feelings um, in order to be with uh, what's difficult and to be inspired. Another kind of thinking that can be cognitively containing is knowing about complex systems. The climate system is a complex system. The geological processes involved are enormously complex. And now they're completely intertwined with human systems, human cultures, and human psychology. In complex systems, uh, things are complexly interrelated. There are feedback loops. Often things behave non-linearly, which means Sometimes a lot of input makes no difference, but sometimes a very small input makes a huge difference. And this is the butterfly effect that I mentioned earlier. Another hopeful feature of complex systems is emergence, which is also called self-organization. Emergence refers to how complex systems are able to reach new patterns of organization that work. In biologic systems, this is called evolution, 
but it happens in social systems and other complex systems also. And I suppose religiously, we would call it grace. Uh, so it's important for us to be able to appreciate what goes on with that defense mechanism I mentioned, disavowal, um, because this can help us understand our social situation. Um, disavowal is where we are able to both know and not know something at the same time. And it's stressful for us now socially. We look around at other people and ourselves and we say, wait a minute, no one is behaving in concert with what we know. It can be dismaying and confusing and frustrating. And it's important to understand that it's also normal. This is the way the human mind works. We don't completely wake up all at once when we're dealing with difficult information. We may intellectually know that human-made climate change is real, but the information is not completely penetrated yet emotionally, or we haven't figured out how to best work at social change and how to change our lifestyles, given the social pressures to continue with business as usual. We're all in the same boat uh, in this regard. What's important is that we're each working on it individually and together. So disavowal is going on where we both know and don't know about climate change at the same time. And we're all in stages of emerging from disavowal in this sort of recursive process where we go in and out of degrees of disavowal um, as we come more deeply uh, to terms with what's, what's happening. So given how challenging this can be for adults, imagine what it's like for young children hearing about climate change. Um, and uh, at, at, at a young age, which they do, any, any child who is overhearing the news is hearing about climate change. And if caregivers aren't discussing it, that can just magnify the child's fears. Uh, this is a picture from a Coco, from the Coco book. Um, one day, Papa Pecan got mail from his sister who said that a fire in her forest just missed her. Young children can have some particular anxieties in relation to climate change. Early abandonment fears, fears of being unprotected, for dealing with these fears, it's important that discussions about climate change are especially within relationships that children have with caregivers and teachers. And it's important that it be made clear to the child that they can continue to discuss this with important adults. The other thing that helps children to not feel abandoned is when they see caregivers taking their own environmental actions, then the child knows that there are capable people in charge and that they're not alone in dealing with this. Guilt is another issue for children because children tend to have an egocentric worldview. Young children tend to feel more responsible than they are. Even if they're not discussing it, young children may be having an exaggerated sense that they have to solve the problem themselves or that they've done something bad and that's why this is happening. So broadening responsibility to the whole community in how we talk about climate change and in how we talk to children is important. Talking about it as a community problem and letting them see responsive actions by a whole community uh, is important. Um, fear of nature can be another fear and it's important that we help children to feel connected to nature. Fear of being powerless can be a fear for both children and adults, of so feeling powerless in the face of something as big as climate change. We can help with this by teaching children about reasonable hope and helping them to maintain what's called reasonable hope. Reasonable hope is based on setting goals and identifying pathways to those goals and revising goals and pathways as you go, as conditions change. This creates a whole hope process where hope is a verb, hope is a process, regardless of the success or lack of success of a particular action. This is very important for us to be teaching our children. 
I mentioned that for the writing of Coco's Fire, we reviewed the literature about how to talk with children about climate change. And we distilled down this process to six steps of a climate talk. Um, having a climate talk with children is kind of like having a sex talk with children. It's something that parents have to be comfortable doing. They have to learn how to do it. And we think this book uh, is a good way to do it. So the six steps are introducing the topic of climate change by finding out what the child already knows, um, explaining the science of climate change, it simply but completely, uh, in the book, Coco's father uh, takes her to meet this owl scientist who uses the age appropriate metaphor of the earth getting covered by too many blankets from the burning of oil, explaining that that affects the weather. Um, then describing the problem with hope, but without sugarcoating the ramifications. And in the Coco's fire book, it's not sugarcoated. Uh, the owl scientist says, this changes the weather, it changes a lot, getting stormy and cold or dry and quite hot. Um, then discussing approachable ways to get involved in addressing climate change, helping the child uh, see the different ways to get involved and find ways uh, to get involved that are appropriate for them. And then uh, opening the discussion up for future conversations, as I said, uh, it's important that children be able to continue discussing this with parents and teachers. And it's never a one and done process uh, discussing climate change. And then it's also important to inspire an appreciation for nature uh, in children. Uh, I want to show you uh, here uh, in conclusion, this is from the Coco's Fire book and um, uh, by the way, as I think I said, I make no money from this book. Most of the profits go to climate mental health research. The book's available on Amazon, uh, uh, amazon.com. It's, it's in English now, but we're uh, hoping to have a, uh, a Spanish language version. Um, children need to be encouraged, I said, in an appreciation of nature. And this is the, the last page of the book where it says, at home in Pine Park, the sun slowly set. What a beautiful place to love and protect. And Coco now knew how to change her scared fire from a flame causing worry to a friend who inspires. Children are already being exposed to information about climate change. So it's important that we're speaking to them about it. Otherwise, they get the message, subtly or not so subtly, that it can't be talked about or that it's too hard to think about. And children need to be helped to be psychological adapters. Uh, the job of the parent is to create an anchor, a center, a place where openness thrives so the child can discuss their feelings and thoughts. It's the job of the parent to be with and listen to the child who's becoming aware of their concerns and to notice them. Uh, the parents should keep in mind that uh, they need to be able to convey that difficult is not the same thing as bad, that we can be engaged in dealing with difficult things. The parent must trust that the child can make it through difficulties uh, rather than feeling that we should be able to protect them from everything because of course we can't and the parent can invite learning and courage and uh, wisdom in children. Uh, so thank you, that's the end of my, my presentation here. I'll stop screen sharing and we can talk more. Um, thank you, Dr. Janet. I mean, um, the book is amazing, Crocus Fire, remember. Um, hopefully we are having a translation in Spanish soon so just please go to Amazon and just look for Father's Fire. Every donation, it's literally necessary for um, every single children to know about what is going on. And um, Dr. Janet, I have only one question. I always say uh -huh. that if um, 7 billion people would be uh, 500 millions of human beings say, um, I can start right now to change the world, you know, by changing myself first, um, and then from myself changing others by my example, we will be literally changing youth. 
like from one year old, right? right. Um, so um, this is so inspiring, and I love what you said. Difficulty is not bad, and um, we tend to overprotect them. Like if they were like very fragile, and sometimes they're more smart than we are. Like they're like, why are you so scared? Like it's dark and what you know they're so innocent that they don't know the challenges that the life have and everything so they're like they don't have that part and we transform that part in darkness in them because of us you know and we don't let them be the the human beings god created them to be you know because we impart them what we have and they're different human beings you know like they're not the same um and sometimes parents don't understand that that um they um, literally deliver them in the world, but they're not them. They're a different human being, you know? Um, so um, that is something that I think that everybody needs to, to just accomplish in their minds, right? Right, right. To, uh, to appreciate that we have more influence than we realize. Um, and uh, there are things that, that can be done, a whole myriad of things. But what I've been talking about here is, is the particular importance of getting comfortable talking about climate change, especially if you're a parent or a teacher, getting comfortable enough with this topic uh, to be able to meet children where they are and, and talk with them about it so that, so that they don't have unnecessary fears and so they can be the kind of adapters uh, that we need, uh, we all need to be adapters to climate change. Yes, and um, mainly when they are living literally in a world when they're with masks. We didn't have that when we were a child. They are literally living the climate change that we leave them, <laughs> to first say something, and they're literally wearing masks and they will have to live like that. We don't know till when, but they're living in that type um, of atmosphere right now. and. Um, for they, it's normal because they are uh, literally born with this. So they are child with one year, two years, and they see people with masks. And they don't know that it's not normal, you know, that we are living like, uh, yeah, like very, very uh, worst times, the worst times, I think. Um, so just talking to them is just talking in their language because they are living it. We are not accustomed, but they know that yeah and what's up with i mean yeah they have not i mean for them it's normal for we like we are the ones uncomfortable talking about it right so you know yeah right. i mean and they are living this world yeah yes oftentimes our own feelings of grief or guilt interfere with our really being able to be with our children and thinking about their their actual lives uh, you know even uh with things perhaps becoming much more difficult, um, our children are going to be able to call upon a kind of grit um, that you know, perhaps we didn't have to have. And that, that may be a beautiful thing. Uh, so it's important that, that we have spaces to be able to deal with our own feelings um, so that we can then be available to the children. Yes, and you know that in Krakow's fire, um, the word fire metaphor is like, um, here, I love this. I love this book. I'm gonna share like with everybody. I just just read it. Like I love this book. Um, you know that um, here that the father goes to um, Krakow and says like, "My dear, are you sad? And um, would you like us to chat?" It's very important for parents just to get to know what's going on to be their children. Right? Are you okay? How, mm -hmm. uh, what do you feel? Are you sad? Are you happy? Are you worried? Are you scared? Um, and Krakow says like, "I'm scared." You know, like he has that confidence with the parents to say, I'm scared and um, something feels wrong. Um, that is literally essential, right? Right, right. Creating those spaces where the parent can be open to what may be going on with the child. And, but in order for a parent to do that, the, they, they kind of have to do their own work first. You know, like I said, the, the climate talk is a bit like the sex talk. You know, the, the parent has to, to be prepared um, to be able to say, OK, I can talk about this. Um, and the parent has to be prepared to say, OK, I can talk about climate. Of course, I can talk about climate. 
uh, of course I know that there are things to be hopeful about and that we can be engaged in working on it and and I can instill I can instill that in my child yes and also I was thinking like um, inspiring hope unless we are with masks unless the atmosphere the climate <laughs> not changed but the climate the war is like literally scary for everybody um, just know that there's always hope like the last thing that we need to like literally get down from our lead to do list is just do not get down the hope you know like there's always hope there's always light so um if parents just get that to their children they will learn that um everything will be okay you know and um it's not being like positive or something it's the truth we cannot um live in a world thinking that um, this is gonna get worse and worse and worse. We're gonna have light like it doesn't work like that, you know So um, I think that that's very important what you told us that parents have to prepare themselves And not only knowing about climate change and what this involves like scientifically and everything that involves like for human beings but just literally psychologically, right? Um, if they are scared, uh, how can I not transform this scared feeling that I have to my child in some inspiring one, although I am still scared, just not give them the scary feeling that I have, right? Right. And a lot of parents find this book helpful. I think if a parent reads through this book, um, it can help them to feel like, oh, OK, uh, I, I can talk about this. I, I see what the necessary attitude is to, to be able to be with this material. Right. Right, and they can feel comfortable also just uh, copying if they don't, they don't want how <laughs> or yeah, just copying. I mean, it's it's really so beautiful, and um, just yes. copying them and saying, okay, um, don't worry, I'm here right now with you, and it's gonna be okay. Um, and that sense of confidence and feeling for the child will bring his identity and confidence also. Yeah, because like and most they're... of the insecurities that we have, it's because our parents were like, hey, right. hey, no, no, you cannot do it, like, and and just leave the child alone <laughs> you know just let them be um so um yeah i think it is like addressing a uh, family anxiety like with this cargo fire um through a children's book is literally educating adults you know um yes. just to um be more aware of how they can be an influence and 100 percent influence in their children um and from the world right yes Mm -hmm. And at the back of the book, there are resources for parents. There are there are tips, other tips about how to talk with children about climate change and information about where to get more information about the, talking with children about. Yes, that. in the bibliography, right? And at the at the back of the book, yes. Yeah, and, yeah. And throughout yeah. the book, there are little acorns um, mm -hmm. in places uh, that that indicate that the parent can go to the back of the book and find even more information if they want. Right. Even they have the information about science, you know, mm -hmm. they can literally educate themselves to know like what um, is climate change, why it affects us everybody and why we're having like this discussion of 1.5 to 2 and everything. Um, also future conversations. I mean, it's so amazing this. I congratulations. Like, thank you for doing this. Like, thank oh. you so much for yes. Thank you for doing this. I mean, it's so important to have um, such a sweet book that we can all relate. We can all every like everybody in the world can relate to the book. Like, I love it's, Coco. Like, it is a sweet book. It's beautifully yes, it illustrated. Is. It's beautifully illustrated. It's simple. Um, but also is but but it's also factual and straightforward. Um, yes, and and um, how did you get with with the name Coco? Why Coco? <laughs> I don't that. know how we came up with oh it. I think God. I think we just all thought it was a cute name. <laughs> yes, it is. I love it. Like Coco, you know, like yeah, it's really amazing. Um, and squirrels and squirrels are really cute. Yes, um, they are. And, yes, they are. And squirrels are almost everywhere. I, I think uh, most people can relate to squirrels. Yes, you're like, 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 like literally, you're like just waiting for the bus, and there's a squirrel, like, like just wanting to, you know. And you're like, hey, how are you? And you know, like, Coco's there, just eating, you know, like, what's up? How are you? Like, it, they're so sweet. Yeah. Um, 
it's 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 so uh, beautiful what um, this inspires and um, just knowing that um, we can be better every single day and they can live in a world that um, they will address they will lead because they are the future generation as I uh, said before we're all here <laughs> we are here to just lead them um, yeah to this well, new world right yes we're old but it's very important that we not abdicate our positions here young people need mentors young yes, people young people need their parents and their teachers to to be there to be stepping up to be leading the way um one thing that a lot of young people can be resentful about now is when older people say oh thank goodness you give me help you know good luck uh that's it's not okay for us to be doing that. Um, we have to be involved to, to be models for them about how to be involved. And if they don't have a mentor, I mean, their parents are not present because they work or whatever, and they don't have um, education or whatever, how can a child be mentored or how can he find a mentor? Like, um, it's easy for them just to find a mentor in somebody that is not from his family. Sure. Sure, if people in the family aren't that engaged or aren't interested, the child can find a teacher, you know, the child can find someone else in their community who is environmentally active, um, or even some other person they can talk to about their concerns. Um, it doesn't, if the parents aren't available, it doesn't have to be the parents, but boy, it sure helps if parents can get comfortable with this themselves and be available to talk to their children about it. Right, right. Yes, totally. Um, being involved, I think it's everything, right? Like being involved, being aware, um, just it's everything interrelated. I got that picture that you had from the world in every single word. And it's incredible how many emotions we have, how many feelings we have, like one within the other one. And that's like literally a bowl of emotions. It's that bowl we transfer the children if we don't educate ourselves and we don't know what we're doing, you know? So, right. um, yeah, that is like hugely important. So difficult is so, not bad. Yeah. Right. And parents and teachers need to have their own spaces to be able to talk about their own feelings so that they don't avoid talking with their children about it. You know, so they need, they need to have parents and children, all, uh, parents and teachers also need to have friends and colleagues that they can talk to about these things, to have space for their own feelings so they don't burden their children with their feelings right um dr janet it was a pleasure like it was a pleasure to uh just listen to you just to learn from you um just to know how much we don't know <laughs> how much we are ignorant in some aspect that we think we do but we don't um it's a pleasure to have an expert like you um in this amazing book of Cocos Fire with us here, presenting the book and just um, letting people know that they have resources, that um, these donations is just to help. These donations is not to um, be luxury about anything, just to be um, grateful and just help and bless others. And that is one of the things that I love about um, this comedy and about everything that you're doing. Um, Dr. Johnny, with all the people around you, uh, so congratulations. Thank you so much for your service and for everything that you're doing. Thank you so much for just leading others to do um, blessings uh, to others, you know, to just um, be just, be good. And that is something that um, I want to be uh, thankful about. So thank you and all the comedy and all the people around you for just doing this for us. And I want to everybody, please, Dr. Danny, say where they can find the book. Um, there's going to be a Spanish translation soon also. And um, please give any, any email you want to say, everything you want to say, just share with the audience, um, please. Okay, so the book is available on Amazon, amazon.com, Coco's Fire. Uh, and if you want to contact me, you can contact me through the Climate Psychiatry Alliance, um, uh, info at climatepsychiatry.org. If you look up the Climate Psychiatry Alliance, you'll find it. Yes. This is Coco, um, this grill, and um, I want to thank you so much for this. Just your time, just your um, experience, just your heart and your mind here, and um, thank you for everything you do.
once again thank you thank you thank you so thanks, much for this thanks for interview. your voice thanks for the voice here carrie it was a pleasure thank you so much <laughs> Bye -bye. Um, thank you so much for being here, everybody. Um, this was an amazing um, guest speaker interview with uh, Dr. Janet Louise. I will try to have her with the adults, <laughs> not only the children, Dr. Janet, <laughs> um, with the adults so we, uh, we can speak um, through our hearts what is wrong with us and can we aware and just get out from who we are so we can know who we are, right? Um, so thank you so much for being with us in Vision. Um, in this uh, Environmental Lawyers League around the world that if you're watching from wherever you are, good morning, good afternoon, good night. Thank you for being with us right now at this moment. May God bless you. May stay safe. And remember that hope, you can never lose hope. So just look at the light and just um, keep it strong, okay? We see you last Saturday, like the next Saturday, right? Yeah, next Saturday, we see you again with another guest speaker. And this time we're going to speak about a very anxiety issue, the war. So we are seeing each other next Saturday. Have a wonderful Saturday, a wonderful weekend. And again, thank you so much for being with us.